Hello, welcome to Meet the Candidates. We are here with Sue Minter running for governor. How are you doing? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Thank you for uh, being here in Brattleboro and visiting us, visiting us. I love being in Brattleboro. I've been here many times throughout this campaign, and it's a special place, and it's got a lot of challenges and a lot of great people to meet the challenges. Nice. So, so, where, so just so people a little about your history, where are you from? Like, what have you been up to uh, until now? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm a working mom. I have two wonderful kids uh, who live in what we have in Waterbury Center, and uh, they've gone through our public schools. I've been very active in our community, uh, volunteering uh, in the schools, uh, coaching soccer, and serving on our planning commission and uh, our economic uh, development committee, revitalizing our downtown. Then I had the privilege to uh, serve in the legislature for six years until I was asked to run the transportation agency, first as the deputy, then as the secretary. Uh, so I've been running the second largest agency of state government, uh, managing a workforce of 1,300 people and balancing a $600 million budget. Uh, in the middle of our tenure uh, was Tropical Storm Irene, which uh, in 2011 really hit this part of the state very badly. And um, it was really our job at the Transportation Agency to help reconnect over 500 miles of road that were damaged, which we were able to do in less than four months, um, something that really didn't just put roads back together, but reconnected communities who had been cut off for many months in some cases. Um, and then I was actually asked to be the recovery officer. So for the next year served as uh, the leader of the effort to help not just rebuild communities, uh, but put people back in their homes, uh, help s restart businesses, help communities like my uh, community of Waterbury, which had become a ghost town after mm -hmm. Irene, actually pull together and uh, rebuild homes, uh, re-envision the future and pull together. And it's a wonderful thing to not only have been a part of helping work with Vermonters in some of our toughest times and seeing what Vermonters are capable of when they come together. Um, in my community, five years later, we have really brought back to life this damaged community and it is now a thriving economy with a craft beer uh, mecca and uh, it's such a thing to look back on and remember where we were and how far we've come. Um, now, what you, you were mentioning a little bit about um, Irene, and my question is climate change is a big, um, you know, I think for all of us around the world, it's like a big deal. Uh, what, what do you think we, we, can, we can do here in Vermont? Um, well, thank you for raising climate as an important issue. I think that our changing climate is really the greatest threat to our generation. And I do see uh, Irene as uh, a weather-induced by climate change, uh, extreme weather like we're seeing right now uh, in Haiti, where I heard yesterday over 800 people taken by that storm, uh, unthinkable. And it is our obligation to address it. Um, and after Irene, I actually got the opportunity to serve on President Obama's task force on climate preparedness and resilience, mm -hmm. had the opportunity to work with leaders across this country who are really post-disaster recognizing the urgency of this matter. And there's a lot we can and need to do everywhere, including here in Vermont. It's why I have uh, developed a climate energy action plan uh, focusing on a couple of things. First, how do we actually reduce what we call peak electric demand. Mm -hmm. That's when we buy off the grid the dirtiest fuel and the most expensive fuel. So I've set a goal of reducing peak demand by 10% over the next five years. And I know that we can do that uh, and will. We have, I'm also looking to region-wide, that means across the Northeast, work together, all of the states and governors working together to actually reduce carbon emissions. And I want to build off of the success of an existing program called REGI, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, which has been uh, um, an agreement of states to do a, what they call a cap and trade. So we've reduced over 24% of carbon emissions. And the state of Vermont 
has actually received investments for the work we've done to reduce of over $10 million. And those dollars have gone into investing in more renewable energy and efficiency. Now, what I want to do is build off of that success to address what is really the elephant in the room, particularly here in Vermont, the transportation sector. Mm -hmm. Transportation in Vermont is 46% of our state's carbon footprint. The idea is to work with the other leaders of the Northeast to expand what we do on the electric side to the transportation fuels. Um, and that's the next phase of what we need to do to further drive down our carbon economy and transform our energy future to a carbon-free economy and to greater energy independence for our state. Yeah, I agree. I don't want to have a car. I literally don't want to have a car, and I feel like it's, it's painful to put gas every time. Um, so uh, what do you think about the um, – so right now there's a big uh, – on Monday it's uh, uh, Columbus Day, but now people want to call it Indigenous Day. Uh, what do you think about the pipeline in, uh, or the pipeline that they wanted to build here, but also in uh, North Dakota? Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think about that? Well, certainly my vision for the future does not include increasing infrastructure for fossil fuel in, for, for fossil fuels. It isn't the future that we need. We need to build a future that moves away from the carbon economy. Uh, we were talking about the regional greenhouse gas initiative. But let's talk about what we can and will do here in Vermont. Um, one of the ways we have established a goal of 90% renewable energy by 2050. We know that this is an ambitious goal, mm -hmm. but it is why we are investing heavily in how do we build out our solar industry? How do we build out far more investment in efficiency? Because the cheapest, greenest uh, energy is that which we don't have to use. Uh, we have many innovative uh, strategies. You know, I was in a home in Rutland recently seeing uh, the innovation that is happening in what is now the solar capital of New England. Uh, there was a family, I visited their home and saw all the ways that they are changing their own footprint. They have a solar panel on the roof. Uh, and this was something that they were able to do through their energy, their fuel and utility bills. They also installed cold weather heat pumps and a heat hot water pump that mm -hmm. actually is new technology that is highly efficient. And you know what's happened for that family? Not only were they warmer in the winter, but they were cooler in the summer. Mm -hmm. And the difference that they were paying in their electricity bill, particularly in summer, um, they had a small home, and the attic, uh, originally an attic, was now built into their children's room, two kids in one room. Normally in the summer, it's too hot for those kids to even be in that room, and they have to use three air conditioners to keep their, um, their home cool. Ever since the installation of their heat pump, mm -hmm. cold heat, they not only uh, don't have to have air conditioning, they can live coolly into those attic rooms. Mm -hmm. And they had saved tremendously on their electric bill. So they're cutting down their emissions. They're using solar electricity. Mm -hmm. They're installing a high energy efficient uh, heat pump and hot water heat pump. So in every way, they are moving the dial on reducing our carbon footprint and getting off of our uh, carbon economy. We can do this. Individuals can do it. Individuals can do it by riding their bicycle, by uh, walking to work and school. We have a whole program to try to get more kids to work and uh, to walk and w ride to school. Mm -hmm. But we can also incentivize electric cars. We need to electrify the fleet. Um, my vision for the future is that we have a, a green highway with electric charging stations. I have a, a, an electric hybrid car, so I have the ability to use electricity um, for a certain range and then switch to hybrid. But the more we can do this, the more every individual can be a part of the solution. That's the answer. We have to take it upon ourselves to invest in efficiency, and the state can help incentivize that. And we have to continue to move forward on renewable energy. Why? Because it isn't just a moral imperative. It's actually producing great, high-paying jobs in Vermont. 
It's bringing young people to Vermont who want to be part of our green energy future. We've already got 17,000 jobs in the green energy and efficiency economy. We're going to grow that under my administration. That's awesome. Um, I want to change subjects real quick. Mm -hmm. Here in Brattleboro, I've seen an increase of the, uh, and I've, I mean, it's really hard to uh, miss somebody that's been affected by the opiate epidemic here. Um, what what kind of things do you think we should uh, you would do as a governor to I guess mitigate that? Yes, well I have uh, also been observing and learning as I have really for the last year been campaigning and meeting with Vermonters from Bennington to Newport here in Brattleboro, more and more understanding of the scope of this epidemic and how it is affecting so many families, so many communities, and our state as a whole. And I will be taking a very proactive approach to managing this crisis. You know, I was asked to be a crisis manager after Irene. And I had the experience being an appointed uh, official in the governor's office. And that's why uh, I will immediately be appointing an opiate crisis manager to do like I did after Irene to be able to be thinking 24-7 about this crisis, to be able to bring around the table not just folks involved in prevention and treatment, but looking at our enforcement community. How do we stop the drug trade? How do we prevent? How do we deal with the challenges of, that are, are really underneath some of this? Obviously, challenges of poverty and substance abuse more generally. But also, how do we bring the provider community, the prescribing habits that have actually um, led to some of the uh, addictions of pain medicine, and how do we bring the pharmaceutical industry to the table mm -hmm. to actually begin creating medicines that don't make people into addicts. So it is a very multifaceted challenge, and I want to bring a top task force, a leader who is constantly thinking about bringing best practices together. I had an incredible experience also in Rutland, meeting with uh, Project Vision. This community has taken on this challenge head on. Uh, four years ago, they established, and in their police department, they have community policing uh, co-located with probation and parole, folks dealing with domestic violence prevention, mental health services, and social services. And they act as a team to address the challenges on the street. It's made a tremendous difference. Uh, the rate of crime has gone down, as has substance abuse. The community as a whole has also taken this on. And they have monthly meetings, 80 to 100 people coming together. How do we support our recovery center? How do we do a better job on enforcement? Thinking about all of the ways in which this crisis need to be addressed and working together. You know, so many people are doing things in their own worlds, mm -hmm. but we need to bring it together. We need to establish real goals. We need to measure our progress. That's how we got through Irene. That's how we're going to get on top of this epidemic. And let's move forward. Yeah, I agree. It's kind of, it's a little painful to, it's yeah. It's terribly painful. Yeah. I know the stories. They're yeah. horrible. Um, I, I just want to hit a little bit on the economy kind of stuff. You have three programs that uh, I, I, uh, I saw, the uh, Invest v Vermont, the uh, Innovate Vermont, and the v Vermont Outdoors. Can you talk mm -hmm. a little about that? Yes, um, thanks. First of all, I want to say probably the largest issue, um, you know, the economy, creating jobs and economic opportunity are really front and center for me, mission number one. And it's because too many Vermonters are really struggling in this economy just to make ends meet because wages are not keeping up with the cost of living. I think Vermonters need a raise, and I'm going to push to increase the minimum wage. But I'm also going to be working to create more pathways to livable wage jobs. Invest VT is about revitalizing our downtowns and village centers so they can be magnets for new business, innovation, um, we have seen success in other s communities, uh, in the city of Barrie, which was really a struggling community uh, six years ago. We put a $19 million public investment in infrastructure and affordable housing. And in six years, it has leveraged over $45 million of private investment, 350 new jobs, 24 new businesses. That's what we can do throughout Vermont. That's my Invest Vermont more entrepreneurs, more opportunity, more affordable housing, and the growth. In Barrie, it's growing its manufacturing, commercial, residential, and retail base. It's a community moving forward. That's what I want to do. 
Innovate Vermont is really looking at the economic sectors that we need to drive innovation. And I'm looking at advanced manufacturing, high tech, and what I call the green economy, the renewable energy and efficiency, and the farm, food, and forest economy. So these are the four sectors of innovation that I will be advancing under my leadership. But you had mentioned also um, VT Outdoors. You know, we need to promote our assets, and we have so many of them. I so believe in Vermont, and I am optimistic about our future because of what we have and who wants to be here. The outdoors is, I think, our, our crown jewel. And uh, I know it brings many people here. But it also brings industry here. Um, we have great skiing, obviously. We have great hiking. We have mountain biking. We have canoeing. We have the Connecticut River watershed. Uh, there is a vision of having uh, more camping opportunities and really a, a canoe path, a trail. Mm -hmm. These are the kinds of things we need to do for the future. To bring more Vermont people to Vermont who will maybe live and stay here and to build up the outdoor industry. We've seen this be a growth industry in places like Montana and Utah. We've seen how they proactively engage the outdoor industry. That's why I'm going to appoint in my <coughs> office an outdoor liaison, someone whose job it is to be bringing together the industry leaders, to be promoting what Vermont is and can be, to be working with the great groups of uh, Vermont mountain bike associations. There are 27 of them right now throughout the state. They need someone who believes in them, and maybe we can make a trail connecting all of those great assets. There's a lot we can do to do to further our great outdoor industry, and I want to do that as governor because it's actually what I have done throughout my life. I'm an outdoors person, uh, an athlete. Um, I have been to almost every state park and uh, love camping, love hiking, and it's something that I know lots of people, we don't promote enough what we have. I agree, I agree. The outdoors are fun. Um, awesome, I mean, here around. Um, I would like to talk a little bit about, um, we talked about free uh, uh, um, um, or the government subsidizing the college, uh, local colleges. Can you talk a little bit about that? Mm -hmm. Again, it really comes back to knowing that Vermonters need a raise and they need an opportunity for a great job. <clears throat> right now in Vermont, we do a great job getting our young people through high school. We have the highest high school graduation rates in the country. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to continuation beyond high school, we're actually near the bottom of the country. Mm -hmm. And this is a huge problem, and I see it as the opportunity gap. Because two-thirds of the jobs of the 21st century require some kind of education and training after high school. But here in Vermont, four out of 10 high school graduates are not continuing beyond. And there are many reasons for that, but it's why I have proposed Vermont Promise. Two years tuition-free community or technical college to give Vermonters a pathway to a future of economic security and success. It's part of helping to develop the workforce of the future. Because as I'm visiting businesses all throughout this state, but even right here, I went to visit uh, Commonwealth Dairy. Mm -hmm. um, that business is growing at double the speed it expected. In its first five years, it is actually where it expected to be in 10 years. They said they'd grow tomorrow if they had qualified workers. I hear that everywhere. Meanwhile, we're not creating a pipeline for them, and we're not creating a pathway for opportunity. We need to not only grow the future workforce so that our economy can grow, but grow opportunity for the next generation of Vermonters so we can break the generational cycle of poverty, which is growing throughout this country and here in Vermont. And I'm dedicated to that mission. That's a win-win-win. It's a win for our students to get economic opportunity and security. If you get a, an associate's degree, we know you earn, on average, 12000 more per year. And with a bachelor's degree, you earn, on average, 32000 more per year. Mm -hmm. So we know that education equals workforce equals economic development, and that's my plan to grow our economy, to create greater economic opportunity, and to give Vermonters a raise. Mm -hmm. Now, um, one of the things you were mentioning was um, uh, bringing people here, because there's a lot of uh, young people that just leave uh, Vermont. So immigration seems like, a, I came here um, from Austin, 
and I can uh, I guess my with this kind of like national sentiment of uh, anti-immigrant, uh, what can we do here in Vermont? Um, I guess to bring uh, do we want immigrants here or do we? Yeah. Well, first of all, um, I want to tell you how disturbing it is to be part of um, the conversation about our future and listening to the national conversation, one which is based on uh, division, hatred, racism, xenophobia, um, to think that that has um, resonance in this country uh, is disturbing. And it's why I want to be a leader who counters that. Um, I am going to be a governor who always keeps our borders open to those fleeing war and persecution. It's why I am so supportive of, governor, of uh, Mayor Chris Loris uh, in Rutland uh, accepting uh, 100 refugees uh, from Syria. It's why my family hosted a refugee family um, six years ago fleeing persecution in Central Asia. Uh, it's why I think we need to have greater diversity in our state, not just to grow and bring in more young people here and keep more young people here and give them the opportunity for economic security and success, but also to actually increase diversity. I think it's very important. Uh, I know that hosting a family uh, who had nothing but the clothes on their back, and this was a family with three children, one of whom was an infant, they lived in our house. Um, we didn't share a word of English between us, but we uh, communicated uh, through food, uh, baking, uh, through song and dance, music, and our family was enriched, and I know our community was enriched by the diversity and the cultural diversity that we embraced. I think that is the future of Vermont. Um, it needs to be the future of our country. Um, you know, we have uh, a lot of undocumented uh, people here, and I'm proud to have uh, been a leader in the transportation agency when we passed the driver privilege card, enabling uh, those folks living particularly in uh, rural dairy farming communities the ability to drive, to get to the doctor's appointment, to get where they need to go. It's why I will absolutely support uh, and re re reinforce uh, bias-free policing to work with our enforcement community to make sure that uh, people of color are not targeted uh, by police. Um, it is the future, um, and we are working towards a much more multiracial future for Vermont. Nice. Uh, now, one question that I went on the internet and I asked, like, what would Vermont want to ask you? And um, they wanted to ask, when is the legalization of marijuana happening here in Vermont? Well, I do support legalization, and uh, we had the beginning of a conversation last legislative session, and I know it will be progressing this year. I am looking forward to uh, legalization and regulation of marijuana. For me, um, it is really because what I see happening is we have a very high using state, particularly among our youth, uh, and uh, what I know is that uh, young people tell me they have greater access to marijuana than they do to alcohol. And it's because it's, uh, I don't think prohibition has worked. Mm -hmm. And what worries me is, what are they finding on the black market? I hear more and more about laced products, um, potent uh, products that um, are potentially dangerous, particularly for young people. And I'm very concerned about the use of unregulated marijuana among our youth. So I'm going to be looking for a system that really helps uh, regulate and enforce uh, the distribution um, of safe products. I am also going to be working to grow a very robust education and prevention program because substance abuse is, as we've talked about, an enormous challenge uh, for, our, for all of us. And as the former Secretary of Transportation, I want to make sure we do not exacerbate uh, the impaired driving, uh, which is a real problem now. Actually, drugged driving uh, has created more challenges than drunk driving. Uh, often it's really the combination of alcohol and prescribed medicines. Mm -hmm. uh, so we need to be thinking about how we enforce uh, with a roadside test keeping people safe on the roads. Can we, can we talk a little bit about the election right now that's happening? Mm -hmm. um, yes, I do want to talk about this election. Thanks. And it's a very tight election. And uh, one of the things, of course, I won uh, a very decisive primary. Uh, I won by 13 points in a three-way. 
And uh, I think that's uh, very um, humbling, and I'm honored by the support I received in the primary. I think it's also caught the attention of the national Republicans. Because in the last um, six weeks, we've had over $1.2 million coming into the state of Vermont by the National Republican Governors Association, who are funded in part by the Koch brothers. And um, let's just make it clear, the Koch brothers, who um, are the oil billionaires, mm -hmm. have decided not to work on national elections anymore. They are focused on states, especially blue uh, democratic states like Vermont, that they want to flip. So um, we are a targeted state by the Koch brothers. Uh, many House members uh, and Senate members, Democrats, are targeted. But I am being targeted. Mm -hmm. $1.2 million have been spent on TV ads uh, for my opponent, uh, some of which are attack ads. I think they are demeaning ads. Um, but we cannot let the Koch brothers win this election. And it's very serious. There are clear differences between me and my opponent. I support increasing the minimum wage. He does not. I support um, the right to choice without exception, and he does not. I believe that climate change is not only man-made, but it is real and it is here and we have to address it. He questions whether it is, in, in fact, man-made. Mm. He doesn't have plans for our economy. I have plans to invest and grow jobs and grow economic opportunity, college affordability. Phil has no plans for college affordability. He has no plans for the economy other than his plan, which is 40 pages, actually talks about tax breaks uh, for the wealthy, for corporations. I actually want to give more focus on growing the middle class, creating jobs and livable wage jobs, and economic opportunity. So there are real contrasts in this election that I want to make sure Vermonters are aware of, and especially the fact that literally outdoor, outside interests are running this campaign, six TV ads already. Wow. So we will, can expect to see more of this, and I want to make sure people engage. Uh, and, and then one last thing that I, um, that I wanted to say was uh, uh, guns. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, uh, uh, it's an important thing for Vermonters here. Um, and you have a plan. Uh, I read a little, a little bit about your plan for um, um, gun. Yes, thank you. And this is another very important uh, point of differentiation between me and my opponent. I believe it is time for common sense gun safety, specifically background checks for all gun sales. And I have raised this uh, early in my campaign. Um, Phil is endorsed by the NRA and believes that our gun laws are fine just the way they are. People talk about how uh, we don't need, uh, we don't have a problem in Vermont. But I know that we do. And it's because when I'm traveling, I'm talking with lots of folks, including those who support women uh, facing domestic violence. We have a huge problem with domestic violence. In 2013, Vermont was the eighth highest rate of domestic violence in the country. Hmm. And now we know that the majority of domestic homicides are domestic violence related, and most of them with a firearm. In states that have background checks for all handguns, we see that 46% fewer women are shot to death by their intimate partners. So I am going to stand tall and strong against the gun lobby. I'm going to stand for women to keep them safe behind closed doors. And we're going to pass common sense gun safety background checks for all gun sales. I'm a strong supporter of the Second Amendment. I don't want to take guns away from law-abiding citizens. But I am interested in making sure that guns are not sold to people who cannot pass background checks. This is common sense. It's important. It's supported by 89% of Vermonters, 82% of gun owners. Mm. It's time, and I'm proud to be leading on this issue. Um. And let me see. I think that was all the questions that I prepared. Um, one, la anything else you would like to let people know about you and what what your campaign is about? Well, really, my campaign is about three things: growing jobs and economic opportunity for the future through the programs we've discussed, supporting working families by 
increasing the minimum wage, but also pu pushing forward for paid family leave. And my Vermont promise to get more young people the opportunity to succeed and ha expand their education and preparation beyond high school. I think it's critically important. And I will stand as a strong steward for our environment, fighting for clean water. Uh, we know we have to address the, the pollution in Lake Champlain and the surface waters of our state, including the Connecticut River. Mm -hmm. But we also have to be looking at clean drinking water. In Bennington, uh, 200 families right now are dealing with toxic contamination from PFOA in their well water. So as the next governor, I'll be looking to address these challenges. I'm really someone who has always addressed challenges head on. I set goals and I accomplish those goals. And that's what I want to do as the next governor of this great state. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for being here with us. This was Meet the Candidates. Uh, so, um, yeah, I uh, hope uh, good luck on your, uh, your candidacy.